All right, everybody, and welcome to Boss Level and the OG crew. Guys, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, Tim Bruce. I'm a senior solutions architect in AWS Games. I'm Dominic Mills. I'm also a senior solutions architect for AWS Games. I'm Gabriel Batista. I'm just a regular solutions architect for AWS Games. We're all regulars, Gabriel. Hey, everyone, this is Karthik. I'm a principal solution architect at AWS. Okay, guys, so before we jump into the discussion about multi-account strategies on AWS, let's talk about the not just the games we're playing. Let's talk about boss fights, since this is boss level. So tell me, what is the most difficult boss character that you remember fighting in, in a game or overcoming or not being able to overcome? So who wants to go first? Who is going to share their vulnerabilities <laughs> and their lack of game playing skills? No skills to pay those bills. Which bosses crippled you the most? I'm going to start with Gabriel first. Go. All right. So I'm going to stretch the definition of a boss fight here. Um, I love old school hard games. And because of that, Super Ghosts and Ghouls is at the very top of my list as one of my favorite games. Now, for those of you who haven't played it, the game is very, very, very hard. So when you get to the last level and you beat everything and you've died a million times and you memorized all of the attack patterns of every single enemy, you come to find that the last level, the boss comes in and sends you back to the very first level of the game with a special weapon that cannot be found anywhere else in the game. And now it's up to you to replay the entire game with that particular weapon and don't pick up anything else, because if you do, you'll get to the end and they'll send you back to the first one. So try that on for size for a boss okay. battle. That All right. hard. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> that is, that's pretty legit. That That is pretty legit. And that was a way that we stretched the difficulty or the play length of games back in the day, right? Was to yeah. create those, those types of those. Man, that's a good one. That is a good one. Uh, Karthik, how about you? Oh, for me, it would be the uh, in the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time game. In the Water Temple, there is a Shadow Link that comes in. The mm -hmm. first time I played it, I think I was probably in on my undergrad. And I, I don't know, I can't remember like how tough of a day I had in school that day. I just came home, played it for the first time, and I was so tripped out. Like, I was like, why is, why, why, why is this, who's this boss? Like, why is he mimicking every movement I did? That's the Shadow Link character. And back then, so I grew up in India, just for context, and we did not get any of the, um, the guides or the magazines that we used to get in the States, right? Like, my, my cousins used to send the game consoles to me in India. I was fortunate for that. But I had no content. There was no YouTube tutorials back then. Yeah. So I was like, why is this character? How do I even get through this? And anything you do, the, the shadow link gets more aggressive. And you keep starting the, the fight from the beginning. It took me a couple of days to figure it out. But that was one toughie. <laughs> that is another good one, too. Yeah. And I remember, I remember exactly what you're talking about. So I would concur. I concur. I concur. All right, Tim, how about you? What is the one crippling boss that you faced in a game that's most memorable for you? So I think the name was Terranax the Destroyer in EverQuest 2. Um, it was one of the first large raids that I remember participating in. And I think half of us were undergeared and unprepared. Um, we just kept at this thing, started about I don't know, 9.30 at night one day. And I think I rolled to bed about 6.30 in the morning, having finally won the battle. Um, it was just a wipe after, wipe after wipe after wipe after wipe. And being a healer, <laughs> I was always running back and rushing people. So like, I, I think it made it extra difficult because that, that solo run back to res was just awful. Um, on the good news side, I did get loot from it. So there you go. Nice. They, and at least it wasn't a Leroy Jenkins situation, oh. right? Where the no, entire no, party, they, the entire party, go, you know, gets wiped out just because of an overzealous, you know, an overzealous player who didn't realize they were creating one of the most 
long running memes that we have right <laughs> outside of all your base all belong to us so yeah good job good on you good on you dominic how about you buddy i could see tim as the kind of guy who rolls <laughs> greed on every single thing <laughs> no <Nope. laughs> uh Mine is a, is another Nintendo game like Karthix. Uh, spoilers abound for this entire segment, by the way. But it is from Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, uh, which I think is just a fantastic game, yeah. one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, and the final boss of that is Bowletta, where the, the main villain, Kakletta, this witch, um, combines with Bowser, I think, like, possesses Bowser, and you have to fight... Um, this this amalgamation creature and uh, maybe it's not the hardest boss but it is certainly my most memorable because i started at the beginning of a flight i was flying to japan and i remember i spent that entire nine hours just, <laughs> just grinding this boss <laughs> over and over and over again uh and i finally finally beat them like as we were touching landing down into japan so it was just this this perfect combination of arriving um, back into my home country and beating this boss is just an unfortunate moment for me. A conqueror st jumping off the plane, right? <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my goodness. Well, for me, uh, you know, look, I went back to my real old school roots. So there, my favorite game of all time is Robotron 2084, probably the most beautifully balanced game ever made. The reason we have twin stick games too. And there was a follow on, um, called Smash TV. And there was an end boss named Evil MC. And it was just, you know, this thing took up half the screen. It, it was just blaring at you. So it was very unnerving. And I just remember how difficult it was to go ahead and crank through, you know, that last boss. But then I was thinking an even older school game and one that just scared the crap out of me as a kid it was a game called Sinistar. And the thing about Sinistar was that it was one of the first arcade games that had real digitized audio. And you would hear it talking to you from off screen as the other ships are collecting min you know, these minerals and pieces of, of debris to build the Sinistar. And he comes roaring onto the screen, literally like, Rawr! I mean, it like shakes the cabinet, like all your hair. It's still to this day when I hear that roar, I may go ahead and play it right here in, in the clip. Just makes all the hair on the back of my neck just stand up. It's like, oh my God, I'm about to die. So yeah, those two, those two, Evil MC and the Sinistar, just absolute jerks of bosses, but amazing bosses too. So yeah. Yep, and there we go. And that is not what we're playing, but bosses that we had to overcome right here on boss level. All right, gentlemen, let's go ahead and jump into the discussion around multi-account strategies on AWS. Let's start off with kind of, you know, the, the premise or kind of the way people typically approach signing up for any sort of service, right? You go ahead and you get the, you you sign up for a particular service and you start utilizing and as you your company grows as your family grows as usage grows for whatever type of account you may have right from a corporate account all the way down to your Netflix account for example um, and you just start letting people use the same common credentials right and so what winds up happening at least it's happened in my house right where when you don't have multiple profiles set up. People start using, you know, one particular streaming service and then somebody goes in and, and takes a run on like cooking shows and all of a sudden it blew up, you know, the recommendation timeline that I had around, you know, science fiction, right? So you start to learn that, hey, having multiple profiles under that account or even multiple accounts for your family, allow everybody to still engage in that service, still share what they love with each other, but also maintains their own likes, their own kind of, you know, viewing optionally, those sorts of things. We see the same type of thing when developers first start in working on a cloud platform. They may start open one account and then start sharing credentials with the other members of their team as they grow. We don't believe this is the best practice for a whole variety of reasons, from the reasons I mentioned that were personal, all the way to security and, and compromise and being able to have granular control over who has access to what during the development, deployment, and operational phase of game development. So with that, 
let's talk about why that single account strategy is bad. Sure. So there's an old uh, uh, anal analogy, Chris, I would say, uh, you don't put your eggs, all your eggs in one basket, mm -hmm. right? So a single account strategy, uh, while it might work for a, a startup who wants to get their feet wet, you know, with a cloud company, they're testing uh, for their product as they launch, as they understand the product portfolio, it might work then. But as they are scaling up to production or public facing, that single account um, will become very hard to manage. Uh, not just in terms of, like when you say manage, I wouldn't say from a CICD process or um, not, not from the processes perspective, but in terms of like, you know, putting all your eggs in one basket. So you need to divide your account strategy based on like a production environment or a developer mm -hmm. environment and a staging environment. Or the other set is like, let's say you have, you expect high traffic. Now you have to look into account limits as well, right? There's a couple of things that we can rabbit hole and talk about it all day. But I think having definitely more than one account is helpful um, when you start going down the path of multi-account strategy. Okay, but so you're talking about putting all your eggs in, in one basket here, right? But how does, um, so if I have my eggs spread across a bunch of different baskets, how does that multi-account strategy really improve a studio's experience on AWS? Like, what is the reason behind it? We don't want to have people with access to different types of services. Like, how, do, again, does that multi-account strategy improve a studio's experience on AWS? Yeah, so the, I think, the ability to be really granular with your policies is a very important piece of a multi-account strategy. The types of things that an artist might need access to versus a infrastructure developer versus an engine developer are going to be completely different. So having everything in a single account makes it very difficult for you to set the proper permissions uh, for each of your users. Uh, with the multi-account strategy, on the other hand, you can create a walled garden uh, for each of your particular developers to be able to work uh, within their means, uh, but at the same time have the freedom to experiment uh, with the different tools that they need to. Any other examples of how a single account strategy versus multi-account can be uh, less productive or in some cases dangerous for a studio? I've, I've got a pretty good example, actually. Um, I've worked with a customer before who's actually a publisher. Um, and they had some backend services that they would provide to the games that they were publishing, to those studios that were making those games. Um, and one of the big challenges that they actually had was figuring out how each of the studios of whose games that they were publishing were actually using their backend services, right? Um, they had it all crammed into one big account. And I, I've seen this time and time again, actually, with, with various games customers. Uh, it's really hard to kind of identify costs in a shared service architecture, right? So um, one tactic that I've seen be successful is actually dividing that up by account. Um, and each of those accounts then provides this kind of cost container where you can look at costs separately, right? Or if they have different requirements for, for the, their backend services that they're consuming, then you can shift those on an account-based level. So it's uh, cost is another kind of column here or a way to slice and dice. Um, to really help support your developers. And I thought that that was a very relevant one, especially within games, uh, as a way of kind of separating out those concerns. And again, keeping your eggs separate. I, there's a lot of eggs being put into baskets here. I, I'm not, <laughs> this is not an activity that happens in my daily life. Yep. All right, so guys, what are some of the big reasons that game customers change to a multi-account architecture? Who wants to jump in? I can take the first one. So there's actually a few different reasons why you want to go from single to multi-account. Uh, one of the big ones, I would say, is the ability to granularly control the policies that are attached to each of those accounts. Uh, when you're talking about working in a single account, you have all of these roles and permissions that are rolling around inside of the same environment, touching the same pieces, touching the same configurations. Um, and this could cause developers to kind of step on each other's toes in a sense. By having multiple accounts, you can create each account as a sort of walled garden that gives developers the freedom to play within their means, uh, but at the same time, not step on each other's toes and not uh, touch tools that maybe they shouldn't be allowed to touch. 
Okay, so but when we talk about what a multi-account structure looks like, is it everybody just getting their own account and then you assigning permissions, or is there an overarching, uh, you know, account that then individual accounts are assigned to? Like, what do we mean when we say multi-account structure? It can be both, right? So some developers might take the look at uh, a multi-account strategy that says dev, test, and live. Others might take a look and say, every developer needs their own account. Um, I have one customer that I work with, and they have a, a policy that every developer gets their new account. Um, credentials get created, the account gets created, and the developer can go and do work. And in this case, the, the customer, the, the studio, um, wanted to release some machine learning features. This was new to their game. They quickly figured out how to wire it up in, in their own dev account, um, which was able to be replicated to live. But the developer also was able to focus more on the feature instead of like what the technology underlying uh, needed to look like because they weren't messing around in a shared account. To add on to that, I mean, um, I, I think a lot of times I've heard people recommend that account structures like multi-account structures should be reflective of an organization but that's that's actually not necessarily always going to be the best way to go about it uh, a lot of the times you want to make those divisions right and when i say divisions i mean where one, one account begins and the next ends um, you want to do that based on what your actual needs are, right? Like work backwards from your requirements. Uh, if you don't need this group of developers to have access to X service, then make that separation, right? Say, okay, these, these, this is a group of people that needs this, has this specific set of needs. Let's put, create an account and put them in there and limit the permissions so that they have access to the tools they need and not to the ones that they don't need, right? Following this principle of least privilege. So sometimes uh, as customers and, and studios, we might be tempted to say, hey, I'll just, you know, I have these teams, I'm going to make a dev staging prod account for each of those, mm -hmm. but that might not always be the best way to go. So just word of warning. So I imagine, I mean, this is, this is just a problem that just becomes more complex over time, right? Um, and it's one of those creeping things, right? When you start to say, well, I'll kind of tackle that down the road. Um, and then unfortunately it can balloon and, and to a point where it becomes unmanageable or in the worst case, something catastrophic happens because somebody had permissions, had right permissions, had uh, permissions to go ahead and deprecate services or something that, that they didn't mean to. And this is especially important when we're talking about live ops and we're talking about actually deploying right right after dev. Um, so what are some of the tools then? So again, this can become really complex. So how can AWS help game developers manage that multi-account kind of approach to utilizing AWS services? So for AWS, there's really two flavors in terms of how you can approach a multi-account strategy. Um, at its most granular, you have AWS organizations. So this is a tool that's going to allow you to create your organization or your collection of accounts, um, manage them through groupings called organizational units, uh, and then it's up to you as the user to create your entire structure to connect the accounts uh, to deploy services across those accounts. Now, most people don't want to have to build everything from scratch. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. And this is where AWS Control Tower comes into play. So Control Tower, you can think of it almost as a managed version of AWS organizations. What it does is that it takes the idea of organizations, or as a matter of fact, organizations itself, uh, and deploys it in a best practice manner with some pre-configured organizational units, with some pre-configured uh, connections between the accounts, and then uh, gives you the ability to enable, to easily enable shared services across all of your accounts uh, from a single pane of glass. So again, the control tower allows developers a single point of access to manage those multiple accounts that may touch multiple types of services that are absolutely critical to the development, deployment, and management of games on AWS. And 
again, simplifies the, the control and centralizes that control. Um, so you can, again, as we talked about, have real granular control over who has access to what. Make sure that those, you know, level designers stay out of the art dev pipeline, right? <laughs> Make sure they can't cross that transom. Control Tower is is that framework to go ahead and get started with. But I know, Karthik, what other kind of tools can customers use to get started with this today? I think, you know, like Stacklet or Cloud Custodian, Control Tower, right? What other tools are available to developers that uh, can aid them in managing a multi-account approach? In my experience, we have, we have worked with customers or I have worked with customers where um, they have been using AWS that predates uh, Control Tower and organizational logic that we have, right? Um, the early set of customers they, of AWS, they, they built their own homegrown tools to do this sort of management. And I can not so proudly say that some of them even used Excel to track their accounts uh, within the organization. <laughs> so, and what happened there? Solution. What happened when they did oh. that? I think we have to sign a different set of NDAs to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so, for customers who have used Excel or tools like like CSV tools to track their accounts. Obviously, the operational overhead is falling on the team or the organization that owns that Excel sheet. The second they shared it, it became an operational nightmare, right? But you know that's how we learn lessons, right? And that's how customers evolve to their next solution or how to evolve their homegrown solution. Netflix actually made a very good blog post. I think this is from 2014, if I remember correctly. We can link it in the show notes after. Yeah. And they started talking about the, the logic that we have to the organizations. They started talking about it back in 2014. They were like, hey, can we have this logical unit or a control plane, access to a control plane that will allow us to like, you know, orchestrate our account structure? Like, and they built it by themselves. So going back to the homegrown solutions, the customers, they built it themselves, like the Netflixes of the world, they built it. They were like, yeah. hey, you don't have a control plane? Sure, I'll build one myself. And right. they had the operational uh, power and the manpower to do it. I mean, but this really goes back to one of the core, you know, leadership principles of our company, right? Which is working back from the customers. So there was a need that was defined. Customer went ahead and built and we said, you know, this is gonna probably be really useful for a whole host of customers that are going to be running these same type of problems. So working back from the customer and being able to deploy this solution, you know, that's where the, the genesis of it came from. That's really awesome to know. I had no idea that that's where the origin of the idea came from. Well, that's uh, one of the benefits of being this long in the company. Uh, <laughs> you hear all these stories and you work with some of these stories and you're like, hey, that happened that many years ago. And you start thinking, how old you are. Um, yeah, and it's all gone yeah. really fast, you know? <laughs> yep, <Yes>. yeah. <laughs> the, the, other, um, the other dimension to um, the multi-account structure, um, through homegrown solutions, we also had many AWS partners that started doing really cool things in this space. Like, you know, we had Cloud Custodian. Um, we had a newer partner, Professor, who started doing data governance recently. But again, these partners are Stacklet, right? Like, you know, Stacklet started doing this. This, these are awesome AWS partners who built the ecosystem around AWS uh, services. And what happened is it gave developers, it gave customers the options to, to double click on not just what AWS is offering, but additional control if the customers demanded it, right? For things like infrastructure as code, for governance, CI, CD policies, everything goes hand in hand with the multi-account structure. We, there was a time we came across a startup who was like, hey, they're gonna make uh, 200 accounts for five employees because you know they every service had to have a production stage A stage mm -hmm. B stage C and then developer environment environment that's not exactly how is scalable for five employees in a startup right? right and it goes back to Dom's earlier point on cloud maturity how mature is the customer on the cloud do they really need 200 accounts for five employees really so it's things like that that you know we um, Cloud maturity is one dimension to it. And the other thing is developer mindset. Folks have to understand what is the business requirement? Do, how do we start setting yeah. this up that allows us to grow like a tree, like blossom like a tree? Like, you know, how can we expand our, our footprint on AWS? And we, we have had some customers who renewed SCPs or um, secure control policies 
uh, which which is not the way to do it. Like you know, you put, SCP is like a hammer approach to everything. You do not use SCPs for managing your accounts or blocking accounts or or like blocking AWS services for your customers. So we have yeah. a couple of options, and you have many tools in that space. Yeah, I mean, look again, working back from the customer, applying best practices based on expertise, and then providing the foundation to have that starting point and then having partners build on top of that to provide additional focused services that speak to very particular, you know, uh, market segments or particular uh, businesses is how we go in and continue to grow, build and expand AWS services for a global audience. And again, it really leans into all of the things that we talk about here from a leadership, uh, you know, principle perspective. But okay, when I'm sitting here now as a game developer going multiple accounts, that sounds like increased cost. So Tim, maybe you want to talk a bit about how developers can address, you know, those fears of, you know, multiplying costs. If I've got more accounts, am I going to be spending more money than I should be? Yeah. And there's a few ways of doing that, Chris. So one is um, sizing infrastructure properly, right? For developer, for a developer, you're not going to, you know, get the largest instance that you need for your game. Uh, for your game backend, you're going to get something smaller for them. So right away, you know, you're not duplicating or triplicating costs, but there is a factor there. Um, we also have some other solutions like the AWS instance, EC2 instance scheduler. Um, and what this can do is turn instances on and off based on a schedule. So, so let's say you have developers, you know, they're not getting in before 9, 30, 10 o'clock, right? Um, they're probably staying late, seven, eight o'clock. So 8.30, shut down the instances. 7.30, 8.30 in the morning, turn them back on. So you're only paying for instances when you actually need to use them. And to the earlier points that both Dom and Gabe made, there are some things that might be shared infrastructure. So for instance, maybe you run a shared database uh, server in a shared account. Um, each developer can have their own database instance running there. So you don't need to duplicate database instances per account. So it, it's all in how you think about the problems that you're trying to solve and think about the, the infrastructure that you need to solve those problems. That's how you figure out how or what level of cost do you want to pay for the opportunity to be able to have the flexibility you're looking for. Got it. So it is that trade-off then between cost and security, flexibility, and just paying for what you use, right? Again, which is one of the advantages of AWS cloud services, right? And it's something that exists across, it's one of the hallmarks, I should say, of AWS, which is allowing you to access these global, secure, performant, cost-effective uh, services, but just paying for what you actually consume. So now I if I'm correct in understanding you, so Control Tower provides the framework to manage all of those different accounts through a single plane of glass. And the instant scheduler allows you to go ahead and then manage the spinning up of resources based on all those different accounts, needs, timing, location, right? Those sorts of things. So they work hand in hand? Exactly, right? So you can deploy uh, EC2 instance scheduler to these new accounts as you vend them out. So it's available to the developers they can set up their schedules. So if you have some teams offshore working in the middle of the night for you, they can set their schedule to be appropriate for their, their work hours. I mean, that sounds pretty awesome. I, and, and I can think of multiple instances in my career where that would have been super helpful and we didn't deploy things like that. So really, really cool to hear we're providing the, the tools again for that level of granularity, security, access, and cost mitigation cost management. Um, talk to me a bit about landing zone design, right? And specifically, I want to talk a bit about analytics, right, in that centralized shared account. So who wants to jump in and talk about landing zone design? Yeah, so I can take this one. This is a really important topic, and it's one that a lot of customers who are new to the multi-account strategy tend to trip on. Um, the nice thing about Control Tower, like we spoke about, because it's a managed service, it comes with a baseline landing zone uh, for you to be able to land all of your workloads in. So at a high level, we have this concept of a management account. Now, a management account is the root of this tree of this organization that we're creating. 
and it's in charge of controlling the rest of your organization. Typically, this root account should be in its very own completely empty account and everything else, all of your workloads should be children uh, or leaves within this tree. Got it. From this management account, we then break, start to break up our workloads into those organizational units, those groupings that we spoke about earlier. Typically, what a lot of people tend to do to start things off is that they'll break their workloads into two separate sections. We have our infrastructure organizational unit and we have our workloads organizational unit. In infrastructure, we're going to keep all of the shared services, all of the applications that are going to touch uh, across, are going to touch workloads across all of our other accounts. So things like that shared database that Tim brought up, um, things like log accounts, right? Being able to centralize all of the logs across all of your other accounts, or even an audit account is something that you typically see, uh, a place where maybe a security specialist can jump into an account and then from there have access to all of the other accounts if they need to go figure out a particular problem. Uh, in the workload section, this is the workhorse. This is where all of your actual workloads, all of the development goes on. Um, and this one is typically uh, the typically designed around your organizational structure. Um, I know we spoke about you know having things like dev, QA, staging, and prod accounts uh, to be able to have your workloads across. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to how you develop, how your team works. Um, that is the core of what a landing zone typically looks like, but there are some other really interesting accounts or organizational units that you can throw in there that I want to touch on real quick. Sure. Uh, one of one of them is our sandbox organizational unit, right? So this is going to be a playground for your developers to go in, a place where they can touch new services, where they can build little things to better understand the tools that are available to them uh, without worries about, you know, maybe running up costs or breaking something in their development cycle. And uh, the last big one I want to hit on is our suspended OU. So I've seen some customers who are security sensitive what they'll do is that they'll build a specific organizational unit, will lock everything down in that organizational unit, right? So they'll put policies that deny everything. And what this allows you to do is that if ever you find an account that is doing something strange or you think has been compromised, it's as easy as moving that account out of whatever organizational unit it's in, into our suspended OU, and all of a sudden that entire account is locked down. And it gives you kind of a quick kill switch uh, to just stop everything in an account so you can go in and figure out what's going on. Okay, and that is that is incredibly useful, especially when, again, you're talking about bringing in you know teams for a period of time and you may have forgotten to go ahead and shut off access to particular things just because you know the expanded list of resources tools and services that that you have becomes more difficult over time to be able to manage so this gives you a really efficient way of saying let me take a, you know an individual an account or a block and move them all into basically this zone that cuts off access to everything so you don't even need to think about it it's all accounted for Exactly. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Okay, but then what about running analytics? Like, I want to see where my costs are, or wh where do my costs lie? Who's using what? You know, and that um, give me you know that detailed kind of rep readout so I can better understand when to spin those things up, how to kind of manage my cost better. Do we have any solutions around running analytics against multi-account uh, kind of you know setup? Yeah, so you nailed it. This is one of the huge benefits from having a multi-account strategy because now you have all of these workloads in their own separated, isolated accounts, but you have the ability to aggregate all of the information, all of the data that they're producing, the logs that they're creating into a singular place, mm -hmm. right? So you start to have this data lake architecture um, where you have a central silo that you can go in and start to run analytical queries against. Um, you can run AI ML or train uh, ML models against all of that aggregated data, and you know that it's in a safe place with the proper policies, so it makes it really easy for all of your different teams to tap into that central source and start to actually produce value out of that data rather than have it individually locked in uh, the separate accounts. Yeah, I, I have a customer who's doing exactly that, but it's not even just their AWS accounts that they're centralizing logs for, they're doing logs for their entire infrastructure. So mm. even their on-prem data centers, uh, they're collating all their logs together and using the same idea of a central data silo 
to collect all of that, those logs and those data, uh, and then run analytical queries to figure out, okay, which of my teams are actually uh, doing the best job? They're, they're like ranking them, right? Like making it a bit of a competition of who's doing the best job of actually being secure, following our, our security best practices, uh, and, and rewarding the ones that do and, you know, helping bubble up uh, where maybe some some best practices aren't being followed, right? Uh, we essays lo love to say the word anti patterns. <laughs> um, so there's there's a lot of options there, but it doesn't just have to extend to AWS infrastructure like this really can be a central pane of glass for all of your infrastructure. For um, another example on that, Chris, is for last year's uh, reInvent, we had Riot Games, one of our customers. Mm -hmm. They spoke at reInvent, uh, this is for the year 2022. They talked about how they use uh, Amazon QuickSight to do like a cost and usage reports dashboard across all of their accounts on AWS. So every VPC flow log that goes through Riot's set of accounts, they have a cost and usage governance engine run by QuickSight and they can track every expense across all their accounts. And this gives them a high level overview for their finance team, for their leadership team, they have dashboards. And we talk about this in the session, so you can link it in the show notes for customers to mm -hmm. look at it. They go into such good details on how these reports and dashboards have helped them um, pr project their costs, right? Like, you know, hey, like, you know, we're seeing this usage of this new Redshift cluster coming up in this corner of our organization. Is that true? Let's yeah. find out in this week's episode of Let's Hunt the Redshift Cluster. So, <laughs> so the customer actually goes into really good detail and it's a, it, it was a very well-received session at Greenland. Uh, this was last year. Yeah. I mean, that, that's super powerful. And again, you know, one of the advantages of the services that we provide is the ability to basically bring those other components in to do, again, run analytics, to go ahead and run management, do all these different things against those services. Um, and allow you to stitch together the solutions that you need to go ahead and manage the growth of your company to, as we said again before, to maximize throughput, to maximize utilization, to maximize security, to minimize cost. And we just lean in on all of that, right? On behalf of our customers and make sure we provide those things. So, okay, I'm convinced I need to shift and start organizing all the people that I have on my dev team as we're building out this big ass game. Um, and now I wanna get started. Like, do we have any guidance? Do we have best practices? Like, where do I go to get started on basically migrating from a single account led organization to a multi-account one? So we actually have a few great resources to get that done. Uh, the first one is the resources page for the Control Tower uh, product page. That's going to give you all of the best practices, uh, tutorials, and walkthroughs on how to get started and build your particular uh, landing zone uh, to start to deploy your workloads. Um, another call out is the um, managing your your studio in the cloud blog that was created by some of our solutions architects here in the games team that take uh, not only concepts like control tower, but expand on that to all of the other satellite services that tend to work along with your organization to do things like track costs um, or secure your account. And that's all in uh, a two part series blog that will link in the show notes for you to go through. That's a fantastic starting point for anyone who's looking to get into this. I was on mute. So excellent, excellent. Too many mute buttons on this side. Um, really cool. Well, any additional thoughts that we want to go ahead and leave with our customers and our, and our partners around setting up and the rationale for using a multi-account approach to AWS? Do not leave all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave with a final thought, which is, um, it may seem intimidating with all of us talking about how various customers are doing this in a bunch of different ways and it's unique to them and they ha sounds like they have hundreds and hundreds of accounts, which some of them certainly do. But I just want to say that no one is doing this perfectly, right? This is a, a maturity journey. It's not something that you're either doing right or doing wrong. It's something that develops over time. Um, so it can feel a little bit like 
parties in high school where you hear like, oh, everyone's doing these awesome things over here and over there. But the reality is just like you, everyone's coming home and just playing video games on a Friday night. So <laughs> don't don't worry. Don't stress. Uh, it's a journey and uh, and you're on it. You'll get there. <laughs> yeah. And of course, resources like this to help you along your cloud game development journey. Make sure you're leaving comments in the comments section so we know what questions we need to address for you and how we can get you more information. So, yeah, I love leaning in to help our partners, help our customers build better for the long term on, on AWS. So, all right. So all any right. other additional parting thoughts? Yeah, I have something really important. Multi-account strategies is something that tends to become more difficult over time. If you have a single account and you put a bunch of stuff in it, now you're looking at a migration job to take the workloads from that single account and move them into their individual accounts. Uh, like Dominic said, don't be scared. Nobody is doing this perfect. It's a maturity journey. Um, get started early, start with a small uh, organization, and then you can grow from there and you will thank yourself in the future. I mean, that is incredibly solid advice, not just for this particular vector of services, but as you start building your games, you know, even if you don't think it is going to be positioned for a, a cloud or a multiplayer audience or these sorts of things, things change. So making sure that you are thinking about how you're building cloud services and solutions into your development pipeline, into future kind of feature expansions and services you want to provide your customer is critical because what winds up happening in typical game development, right, is everybody's trying to get to that vertical slice of playability of art. And it's like, oh, we'll patch everything later. We'll just go ahead and fix X later. And then what we get is this Gordian knot of art, right, that we then put out there that you can't easily disassemble. So again, making sure that you're thinking about how you can possibly leverage, again, cloud services, cloud solutions in your development journey. Important to do that as early as possible. It saves you a ton of headache, make sure everything is integrated, gives you a much greater sense of control and relief as development costs balloon, as the, the size of your team grows, right? As the size of your player base grows. So super excellent advice for our audience. Thanks, Gabe. So that brings us to the end of this episode of the Boss Level Podcast. Make sure you go ahead and hit the like and subscribe and alert buttons to know when we go live with this content uh, on the AWS channel. So if you have any other questions, make sure you go ahead and leave them in the comments. Reach out to your AWS representatives if there's any other programs you'd like to see or hear about on Boss Level. And I want to thank my awesome group of panelists. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate your time today and educating our customers and how to go ahead and set up multi-account cloud services on AWS. You all have a great rest of your day.